Great. Welcome, welcome back, and thanks, uh, thanks for coming back for our next session. Uh, our, our first speaker today that's really going to dive down into the topic is Professor Detlef Nock. Uh, Detlef actually runs BT's AI in data science research program, so I can think nobody better qualified to cover off some of the topics. Uh, what he's going to talk about is programming with data, and as everybody who plays in this space knows, the data is the most important thing, but you don't always get good data. So how do we deal with that? So on that note, what I'll do is I'll hand over to Detlef. Detlef, over to you. Thank you very much, Mike. Hi, good morning, everybody. Um, I want to talk about data, and data is the central element when we talk about data science and AI. But often, the data takes a second stage, and people focus a lot on the kind of the algorithms and uh, the computer science behind it and uh, the machine learning. Andrew Ung, who uh, is one of the co-founders of Google Brain and um, uh, was the chief scientist at uh, Baidu and uh, set up the AI lab over there and grew it to over a thousand people. And uh, he also set up Coursera. He um, works in machine intelligence and focuses on natural language processing and image recognition. And he created the field of deep networks, among others. And uh, so he had a, a strong focus on developing algorithms and uh, uh, machine learning methods. But now he has changed tech, and he says we need to focus on the data, because the data is what's really important. When people start uh, doing a data science project or start uh, doing machine learning or AI, they at the outset, very often, come across one of the biggest fallacies in that field. And that is, they think they have seen the data, and it's good. And it usually isn't, and usually they haven't seen it at all. The second fallacy is focusing on algorithms. So the thinking that a particular algorithm will deal with this data. And so that could be a deep network, or just insert your favorite complex method here. And this focus on the analytical method and trying to just swap it out for a different one is a wrong view. We should focus on the data. And we have to be aware that we may not have seen it all, and maybe it's not as good as we think it is. When we work with data, it's usually for one of two reasons in this field that we are looking here at this conference. There's the data science perspective, and this is we are after insights. So you could be after insights just because you're interested, and huh, that's interesting. Or you want actually make better decisions, so you use the insights operationally, and you find something out, and that informs your decision-making process. And that's particularly important for businesses, of course. In the AI perspective, it's usually to use data together with machine learning to automate decision making. And that means you either want to increase the number of decisions you can make in a given time, so that could be like trivial decisions maybe in marketing, at the decision making that decides what sort of advertising you should see when you click on a web page, or more complex decision making. For example, <clears throat> here at BT, we use AI to run our uh, mobile workforce, so an AI system uh, plans which job should go to which person at what time. The problem with automation is that it's also always an opportunity to make more mistakes and make them faster. So you have to get automation right in order to get value out of it and not um, uh, mess things up. And this is typically, again, based on your understanding of the data, not so much on the actual automation method that you put in. So of course you can have software bugs. Automation is always software, and you can produce bugs in the way you produce the software. But a lot of uh, misbehaving AI and misbehaving data science is because people have not looked at the data properly and haven't understood what the data is like that they have used to produce their particular solution. Have a look at this statement. And what, what do you make of this? My code has bugs. Let me just try using Python 3.9 instead of Python 3.8 and see if that works better. So assuming you know that Python is a, a programming language and Python 3.9 is just a different version of the interpreter uh, 
compared to Python 3.8, but it's essentially the same programming language, then hoping that swapping the uh, language interpreter gets rid of your bugs is probably uh, not a good idea. So the idea using different software, if your code is not working, doesn't really make sense. So if you're talking to a software engineer and you say something like this, you'd be laughed out of the room. But have a look at this statement, what you think about this. A random forest does poorly on the data. Let me try a deep network instead and see if that works better. It's a very similar statement, <clears throat> but it has some veracity. So it could happen that a particular analytical method that you apply to the data is the wrong method for the type of data that you have. You need to understand what data you have and what method you want to use to make sure that you use the right method, of course. But if you run into a problem with your data analysis, if it doesn't work out the way it should work out, then just swapping to a different method is not really solving the problem. This is a little bit like the first statement when you just swap to a different software system and hoping that your bugs will all go away. Swapping a data analysis method does not fix bad quality in your data. The issue with data is that we can't read it like code. So when you produce software and you write code, then you can read it and you can understand it and you can check it for, for bugs. And uh, you can also run tests on it. And uh, we, I, I'm talking about tests on data in, in, in a minute again. But reading code to find bugs is one thing of improving it, but reading data is not really an option. Typically, we are talking about millions of lines of data, so reading through all of it um, wouldn't work. The data is also in some sort of code, so it's numbers representing stuff, symbols representing stuff. So just reading a line of data may be meaningless and you may not be able to interpret a line of data without actually analyzing it. When we start analyzing data, we should realize that we always ever only get a peek at the data. We don't see it uh, comprehensively. <clears throat> we don't see it as one large object that we can look at it from all sides and understand what it really is. We have to peek at it from different angles and try to make uh, an image of it, try to understand what it really is. And that's a challenge. So here's an example that illustrates this. You may have seen that before. This is the so-called data source data set. It's an artificial data set and has been crafted in a way that all of these sets, all of these plots that you see here on the chart, they have the same mean for both x and y. They have the same variance for both x and y and they even have the same correlation. And you briefly saw um, the head of a dinosaur poking up. So you can craft data in a way that it looks identical, although it's completely different when you look at it more clearly. So looking at data just through summaries like we do on, the, on, on top of the picture here, where we, show it this, uh, we look at the statistics, the mean and the variance and the correlation, doesn't really tell us what the data is like. So we have to see it in its entirety if we can. With two-dimensional data, that's easy. You can just plot it and you can see uh, what the patterns look like. The more dimensions you have in your data, the more data columns you have, uh, the more impossible that becomes. Still, there are good data visualization techniques that help you understanding what the data is like, and this is called exploratory data analysis. So that's something you always have to start with, and that's where you have to spend most of the time. People always say when it comes to data analysis that 80% of the time is spent in data wrangling. So this is taking the data out of a repository and putting it into shape so you can work with it. Actually, this time is going to increase, at least in the percentages, because the following steps, the analysis and the machine learning part, get more and more automated in modern cloud <coughs> environments. So you can essentially now produce a, a model that models your data through, by a press of a button. So the time that you spend on the actual modeling shrinks, but the time that you spend on preparing data doesn't really. So the uh, amount of time, relatively speaking, will increase. 
And that means you should really invest effort in this space. And if we are to bring down the overall time of data analysis and machine learning, then we need to look at methods of better handling data and making sure the quality of the data is right before we even start. Let me come back to this idea of programming with data. So this, um, this chart here illustrates the idea that as you add data to this plot, the regression line that separates the uh, white dots from the yellow dots changes over time. And so this is the idea of programming with data. So the model here, the line that tells us something about how to separate uh, white from yellow is the model. But the model is driven by the data. So you can imagine that by putting more data into this plot, you program this line. And this is a view I want you to take, that the data is essentially the code that you produce to create a model. You may not be in control of this code. You may not have produced it yourself. You take it and you have to work with it. But think of it as code and think of it as something that has to be right before it gives you value. Another aspect of um, data is checking data that goes into a model. <clears throat> in software, we are used to testing inputs. Right? So if you put something weird into a field for an email address, it will call you out and say this is a wrong email address. If you do this with a machine learning algorithm, then usually you get an output. So here's an example of a system that has been trained to recognize objects and it has been fed some patterns that have nothing to do with any objects it had learned, but still it comes back with a label for the picture from one of the images that it has learned before. <clears throat> so for example, it recognizes something as a pinwheel, which is just a color pattern. This is one issue in, in the space of uh, data science and machine learning, that inputs into these models are usually not tested, and so you put data in that you don't know should be put into the, into the model. So if data is your code, then how do you find your bugs? You start out by checking, does your data reflect your objectives? So is the data actually useful for what you want to do? Is it complete? Is it meaningful? Is it free of errors? Does it have bias? Bias means there's a bad history repeating itself. Right? So you train something with data that is old, that is historic, even if it's just from yesterday, but is tomorrow actually like yesterday? Do you want tomorrow be like yesterday? And you have to uh, check these kind of assumptions you're making when you use data and uh, put it into data analytics, data science, or machine learning. How trustworthy are the labels? So if you uh, learn something from data, then you typically have labeled data. So you have a row of data, and you have a label that tells you what this row of data means. The row of data could be an image, and the label is what object is in the image. It could be uh, a customer who has uh, churned or is, is coming back to the company. But who has put these labels? Are they actually correct? There could be actually malicious labels. It's called data poisoning. So has somebody had access to the data and had the opportunity to sneak in data that is actually wrong, that, that is labeled with something that is not true? And this can be done in order to build secret backdoors into your model that you create from data. How do you know that this is not in your data? And what else are you not seeing? There's this term called dark data, and here's a uh, book recommendation from me, Dark Data by David Hand. It talks about all the different types of data that you're not seeing, that you're not aware of, that is missing, or that has been uh, put into data sets without your knowledge. And this is something that uh, we need to be aware of, the kind of the quality of the data, what's missing in the data, what's in the data that shouldn't be there, because what we're doing with the data is we are programming a model that later will represent the data and it will be used for decision making. And therefore we have to make sure that our code, our data is pristine. Thank you very much. Great, Detlef, thank you very much. Once again, some very interesting insights there about uh, the basics, if you will, of, of, of data science. Um, I now want a data source. 
Yeah, I like that. Yeah, <laughs> uh, uh, so that, that was really good perspective. So you know, thank you very much for that. Some really interesting insights that we can build on over the next three days. So uh, this is going to take us to our next session. So I'm going to close this session. If you go onto your session panel on um, on the feed loop and then click on the next session with Michael Free, we'll be kicking that off in about a minute. Thank you very much.